In spite of his blindness, Jim Stovall has been a national Olympic weightlifting champion, a successful investments broker, the president of the Emmy award-winning Narrative Television Network, and a highly sought after author and platform speaker. He is the author of more than 50 books, including the bestseller, The Ultimate Gift, which is now a major motion picture from 20th Century Fox, starring James Garner and Abigail Breslin. Eight of his other novels have also been made into movies, with two more in production. Steve Forbes, president of Forbes magazine, says, Jim Stovall is one of the most extraordinary men of our era. Jim Stovall has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes magazine, USA Today, and he's been seen on Good Morning America, CNN, and the CBS Evening News. Would you put your hands together? Well, yeah, standing ovation already. Yeah, that's good. We do walk by faith and not by sight. <laughs> and uh, whoever it was that installed that uh, stairway over there is not a blind guy. Thank you. And um, each and every time, I stand up in front of a group of people like this somewhere in the world to share for a few moments about some things in this life I believe to be important. Every time I do this, I'm always reminded of that time in my life when this was not possible. It was 36 years ago that morning I woke up, I instantly realized I had lost the remainder of my sight and I began learning how to live my life as a blind person. Tremendous faith walk. The scriptures promise us that all things work together for good. It did not say all things are good, but all things work together for good. The problem is we're the ones that have to supply the work. Well, I had no idea what to do. I was 29 years old, I had never met a blind person, and I did not have a clue what I was going to do with the rest of my life. In fact, the only plan I could come up with that morning involved moving into this little nine by 12 foot room in the back of my house. And in my little room there, I gathered my radio and my telephone and my tape recorder, and that was my whole world. <coughs> the thought of traveling a million miles and speaking to multiple millions of people every year in arena events around the globe, the thought of running a television network with over a thousand stations, the thought of writing 50 books and now having the ninth one turned into a major motion picture, the thought of writing a weekly syndicated column read by three million people each week on four continents, the thought of doing two national radio shows a week, or the thought of being here and talking to you, my friends and neighbors in my hometown, the thought of this would have been as foreign to me as going to the moon. So I sat in my little nine by 12 foot self-imposed prison, day after day after day, getting more and more depressed and more and more discouraged. And I'm quite certain I would still be there this evening, except for one thing. I literally ached for people like you to come and talk to. So I want you to know what a privilege it is for me to be here. Few people I have to thank. First, I wanna thank my friend Jesse for asking me to be here. You know, I know what you mean to him. So it is a great value and honor to me when he turns this microphone over to me because I know how much you mean to him. And we have spent a lot of time, and Jesse, as most great leaders, has had many opportunities to do what was good when something great was right around the corner. And boy, we always want to grab that easy thing right now. And he has 
been stalwart in his leadership and single-minded in his focus, and he's a great friend. Every group emulates their leader, and you're fortunate to have my friend Jesse Leon Rogers here. So I want to thank him. Yes, please. I want to thank my friend Dave Leggett that introduced me to this organization. Dave and I have been friends for 40 years. And a lot of people wonder why Dave and I are friends. We kind of do different things. We move in different circles, but we always stay connected. And that little room I told you about was a real place. I go back there every few years. There's a little old lady lives in that house now, and she's turned that back room in my house into kind of an embarrassing shrine. She has all of my books and movie posters and everything all over the place. <laughs> and every few years I go back and visit because... Uh, Every once in a while, it's good to go back and remember where we came from. It reminds us, uh, we may not be where we want to be yet, but we ain't where we used to be. <laughs> and, you know, when I was in that room, I remember uh, as a young man, my one ambition in life was to be an All-American football player and then go into the NFL and make my living doing that. And the scouts and coaches that monitor those sorts of things assured me I had the size and speed to do that. So I thought it was just a matter of time till I got there, then at a routine physical to go play another season of football. They always check you out real carefully before they take you out for the season. They want to make sure that you're healthy before they try to kill you. <laughs> and during that exam, I was diagnosed with a condition that would cause me to lose my sight. And all of my friends and fans and hangers on just kind of faded away. And I've told the story about that little nine by 12 foot room. They tell me to over 4 million people live at events around the world. And other than my wife, Crystal, who sends her love, she's on the beach in Fort Lauderdale, Florida this evening. <laughs> and uh, I said, are you sure you would rather be down there than go to the city elders meeting with me? <laughs> She did say it was close. <laughs> but um, other than my wife, Crystal, I know one human being that was ever in that room. And his name's Dave Leggett. And that'll buy you a lifetime of friendship right there. I'm a big fan of movies. I, uh, I've had best-selling books. I have 10 million books in print in 36 languages around the world. And it's had a great impact, but it pales in comparison to one hit movie. And uh, I am convinced that if, if Mark Twain or William Shakespeare or the Apostle Paul were alive and with us today, in addition to writing, they'd be making movies. And um, it's been such a blessing and I, I am a student of great films and when I think of Dave, I'm reminded of that uh, great movie Tombstone about the gunfight at the OK Corral and Val Kilmer plays Doc Holliday. And he's going to go out and face almost certain death to help his friend. And there was a reporter there that day, and he asked Doc Holliday, why would you go out and risk your life and probably die for Wyatt Earp? And he said, Wyatt Earp is my friend. And the reporter said, man, I got a lot of friends. And Wyatt Earp said, I don't. If you can get through your whole life and count your true friends on the fingers of one hand, you had a good run. One more person I want to thank this evening. When you live your life like I do as a blind person and some of the most talented and gifted people in our field of movies, television, business, publishing, finance, some of the best people are willing to dedicate their lives. And in my case, they dedicate their eyes to making it possible for you to do what you do. You take every opportunity, including ones like this, to simply say thank you. Janice Taylor is a great friend. Um, she's a great real estate professional, member of our community. And she travels with me and goes to events with me just because she's a friend. And uh, I, I just want to take this opportunity. Would you please welcome and thank Janice Taylor right there. Now, Jesse loaned me his stool here, 
that he uses. Now, I've been told a lot of people don't get to use this now. But um, this, this last week, I took 11 steps on a 12-step staircase. I don't know much about those 12-step programs. <laughs> but we were talking about it at the dinner table earlier this evening. If you're going to do the 12-step program, get the last one. <laughs> after, after I finished my uh, football career, I became an Olympic weightlifting champion. And I got to end my athletic career representing our country. And uh, I'm reminded of that every morning when, with my left knee when I try to get out of bed. So um, I want to thank Jesse. Jesse told me when I used this stool, he said, now, Jim, that's the storytelling stool. <laughs> that's what he told me, folks. And he, he said, now, anything you say when you're sitting there, your jokes will be funny, <laughs> your stories will be poignant, and you will change people's lives. So if this doesn't work out good, don't blame me. Just go talk to Jesse. <laughs> Every time I get up to talk, I'm always reminded of the first time in my life when I got up to speak after losing my sight. It's one of those experiences that we all have that kind of keep us humble. And I just started the Narrative Television Network. We got an Emmy Award for our first season on national television. We were growing really quickly, and things were great. And then something happened to me that happens to a lot of entrepreneurs. No matter how great things are going, one day you wake up and you realize, I don't have a clue what I'm doing here. <laughs> now, if it has not occurred to you that you don't have a clue what you're doing here, trust me, it's occurred to the people around you that you don't have a clue what you're doing here. <laughs> well, this particular morning, I woke up and I realized, boy, there is probably no one in North America less qualified to run this television network than this blind guy from Oklahoma. That bothered me. So I went out to L.A. and I hired not one but two consultants. This should be avoided whenever possible. <laughs> but I hired these two entertainment industry business consultants. Now you could tell these boys were entertainment industry business consultants because they had both the briefcase and the ponytail. That's very important in our entertainment industry. <laughs> And I paid them an inordinate amount of money to come to Oklahoma, which you do know is the entertainment capital of the world. And I paid them to come to our offices and studios there on South Memorial and tell us how to run this network we were already running quite successfully. Well, they wandered around the building for several days, really annoyed everybody. And then they came to me for the report and they said, Jim, you're new to the television network and new to the industry. And one thing that's expected of you, you got to get out and meet all of your station managers across the country. Well, at that time, we had 1,100 and something. I was just a little ways out of that 9 by 12 foot room I told you about. I could kind of stumble out of my house and fall into the back of the limo and ride to the office and stumble around there all day and reverse the process in the evening. But when they told me they wanted me to go to 1,100 different towns and cities and meet with these people, I said, boys, that ain't going to happen. You're getting paid way too much money. You're annoying everybody. Come up with something better than that. <laughs> and they said, well, Jim, you, you've really got to get out and schmooze these people. It's expected. I had never heard that term before. I said, well, you may schmooze people out in L.A. and get away with that. I don't know. But you start schmoozing people here in Oklahoma, they'll lock you up. I'll tell you that much <laughs> right there. I think Jesse was right about this stool. That usually doesn't get that good a laugh, guys. <laughs> so they wandered around, and in a couple days they came back, and they said, Jim, we have a plan B. I said, well, good. Tell me about your plan B. And they said, based on your experience as an Olympic athlete and your success in business and winning the Emmy Award, we believe, Jim, we could book you into arenas and convention centers as some kind of motivational success speaker and then we'll invite our people in on a regional basis. And that way, Jim, we could kill two birds with one stone. Now, I never was quite sure why these boys from LA like to kill birds with stones, but apparently it's a really big thing out on the left coast. The next time you're out there, just remember the more birds you can kill with the fewer stones, the better they like it. 
And I said, when would we have to start? And they said, Jim, they booked these big arena events at least, at least six months in advance. So you don't have to do anything for six months. Well, folks, I don't know what my schedule is tonight after this meeting. I'll agree to anything six months from now. Doesn't matter what it is. In fact, if, if city elders, if you're getting up a group to swim the English Channel or climb Mount Everest or something in the fall, go ahead and put me down. I'll agree to anything six months from now. I think that's how I got here tonight. I'm not certain. <laughs> well, what seemed like a few days, certainly no more than a few weeks later, they come back down the hall to my office and they said, Jim, it's time to go. Like one of those bad prison death row movies, you know. <laughs> Blind man walking, you know. Right there. And they said, Jim, it's time to go. And I said, go where? And they said, Jim, it's time for you to go make one of those speeches you told us you would make. And I said, you clowns told me I had six months. And they said, Jim, trust us, it has been a full six months. You see, they always lie to the blind guy. And they think they get away with it. In reality, they do get away with it. I just like to let them know they know. I know they get away with it. Well, I said, okay, where am I going? And they said, Jim, we have booked you into the Anaheim Coliseum where you will be the motivational speaker for 14,000 state government workers. <laughs> now, if there's anyone here that works for the state government or knows anybody working for the state government or, or even discovered anyone doing any work <laughs> for the state government, That has worked in all 50 states and at least a dozen foreign countries. But if you are one of those people, uh, please excuse my next comments, but I thought being the motivational speaker for the state government workers was something really close to raising the dead, if you know what I mean. I mean, it just doesn't happen every day. It'll get you a spot in the New Testament, and, uh, and if it ever happens, I mean, save the, save the movie rights on that deal, because it's, it's going to be good. Well, our Vice President Kathy Harper and I, we got on the plane and we got out there and I'm standing backstage in this huge arena, scared to death, and it's my first speech since I'm totally blind. And I'm standing there and when you're blind, you, you pay really close attention to things around you. And standing there in the back of this arena, you know, I was trying to remember, was it 12 steps or 13 to the front of that stage? That can be really critical at a certain point in time. <laughs> And I was trying to remember where were all those potted palm trees they put out there on the stage. You guys, you meet a lot of people, you travel, you know a lot of folks. If you ever run into the man or woman, whoever it was, that decided they should go into arenas, convention centers, television studios, right where a blind guy might be working, and they decided to put potted palm trees all over the place, would you tell them I'd like to speak with them? Because over the last few years, I've had kind of a close personal relationship with some of those potted palm trees. <laughs> but since this is a family show, I'll move on. Well, I'm standing backstage, and as I said, when you're blind, you pay really close attention. And standing back in the, 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 the back of that arena, I could tell that someone had come up and they were standing right next to me. You ever had anybody kind of standing in your space a little too close for comfort? Well, there was somebody standing right next to me. And they weren't making any noise. I could just sense they were there. Now, folks, if we have a chance to meet tonight after the program, or at some point in the future, you have got to make some noise. <laughs> if you don't make noise, I won't like you. I may not like you anyway, but if you don't make noise, we don't have a chance. Well, there's this person standing right there. You know, and I turned to Kathy and I said, look, uh, I think there's somebody standing here. And she said, Jim, I don't know how to tell you this, but there's a guy standing right next to you and he's holding up a note in front of your face for you to read. <laughs> and I said, you know, Kathy, I'm, I'm a little nervous here. I'm about to have a panic attack. I really don't need this. What does this guy's note say? And she leaned over and read, Jim, the note reads, I'm deaf, can you help me find the front desk? <laughs> So, so I turned to the deaf guy, 
And I said, no, sir, I'm blind. I can't help you find nothing. You got 14,000 people in the building. You got to ask me where the front desk is. I told you, you could ask a state government worker. Even, they could probably help you with that. They'd get six or eight of them together. They'd form a committee, but they'd eventually figure that out. They would. So I turned to Kathy and I said, uh, what's he doing now? She said, he's holding the note closer. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, I explained it to him louder. We never did get together on that thing. And somewhere here in America, there's still a poor deaf man wandering around looking for the front desk. And if you run across him, I would appreciate it if you would help him out. Well, that ends the deep intellectual part of my remarks this evening. I like to get the heavy lifting out of the way right up front. Jesse asked me to come here and talk to you about productivity. I counsel with the leaders of many of the Fortune 500 companies. I've written several books on productivity. It's the hot topic in the world today. But productivity is not a matter of how to do something or what to do. Productivity is a matter of why you do it. If the why is big enough, the facts don't count. And I want to share with you just a little bit of my journey. I was sitting in that little 9 by 12 foot room I thought I would never leave. And God had his hand on me. And he had a plan for my life. And before losing my sight, that room in the back of our house was our television room. So sitting there all alone, broke and scared in the dark, I knew right over there is a TV and a video player in my collection of classic movies. And one day out of just sheer boredom, I picked up a movie, put it on. It was Humphrey Bogart's Philip Marlowe story, The Big Sleep. And I thought, I've seen this so many times, I'll just be able to listen to it and follow along. But then somebody shot somebody and somebody screamed and the car sped away. And I got really frustrated and I said, somebody ought to do something about that. And the next time you get really frustrated and you hear yourself say, somebody ought to do something about that, you just had a great idea. <laughs> Opportunities come disguised as problems. And I thought if somebody would just take those, those TV shows and movies and educational programs and in between the dialogue where the characters are, are talking, if they would add one more voice, the voice of a narrator, 13 million people in America could access television and millions more around the world. And that was my first project. What I didn't know about television would really amaze you. We launched not having a clue what we were doing. I had one employee, she was legally blind, I'm totally blind. We were the blind leading the blind. <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing, we didn't have any money, but boy, we had a dream. And we held a press conference when we started and about five or six reporters showed up and a few other people. And then after I was done explaining who we were and what we were gonna to try to do in the world, one little old lady came up she had a cab driver helping her. She said, I paid this man to bring me here. I'm blind. And I've never been able to see a movie. I've never been able to see a television show. There's nothing I can do to help you. But I want you to know every day, as long as you do this, from 7 to 7.30 every morning, I'll be praying for you. And folks, there was a lot of days. That's all I had. And if that's all you got, it's enough. Well, we got an Emmy Award for our first season on national television. Still didn't know what we were doing. And I went to New York to get the Emmy Awards, and I did a deal on Larry King. This was back in 91, 1990, 91. And um, he had interviewed some of the people that were getting Emmy Awards. And I was upstairs in my hotel suite trying to get my tuxedo on while I'm trying to get CNN on the TV so I can see myself, or at least listen to myself on Larry King, and I couldn't get the TV to come on. So I called down to the front desk. I said, can you send up a bellman? And Larry King's coming on in about four minutes. I'm, I'm on the show, and the TV's not working. Well, the guy was quick. I'll give him that. He burst into the room, rushed over, hit the power button on the TV, and the TV comes on. 
So in that kind of snide, New York City bellman tone, he said, sir, if you want to watch the TV, you got to turn the power button on. But being a good New York bellman, he's going for the big tip. So he don't want to embarrass me too much. So he changes the subject. He said, sir, what are you doing here in New York? I said, well, I'm going to get an Emmy Award for engineering expertise that's expanded the scope of television. <laughs> and he thought that was pretty amazing for a guy who didn't know how to turn one on. <laughs> of course, I had to remind him, before you make too much fun of me, remember, when we checked in here, you were the one carrying my bag. <laughs> and you're the one watching me on TV here. Well, shortly after that, I was asked to be the keynote speaker for the National Association of Broadcasters. I'd never spoken anywhere in my life. Never had an idea of being a speaker. When I graduated from ORU, you had to take a, a course called Oral Communication. And the teacher told me at the end, Jim, we're going to give you an A because you worked hard and you did good on the written material, but we hope you find a career that leads you away from public speaking. <laughs> that professor was on the board of Toastmasters nationally, and she happened to be there the day they inducted me into their Lifetime Hall of Fame for public speakers. She said, I didn't know you could speak. I said, I was just waiting on the message. Just waiting on the message. Well, I gave that speech. I was scared to death, but I thought, these are all the networks and the cable TV operators that are trying to, that I'm trying to sell narrative television to, so I just thought of it as a big sales presentation. Kind of like our State of the Union address last night. <laughs> Sometimes even if you're the blind guy, you gotta call them like you see them. So at the end of the speech, the three separate people came up to my assistant, Kelly, who was my marketing director, and said, we'd like Jim to be our speaker at our national convention. And the next thing I know, I'm all over the country speaking at these events, and, and uh, I was doing a West Coast tour of arenas, uh, three of us on a program, Dr. Dennis Waitley, Dr. Robert Schuler, and me. And I remember one day I'm sitting backstage getting ready to go do my part, and Dr. Robert Schuler comes up to me in that Dr. Schuler voice he really used to talk with. And he said, my friend Jim, I believe you should write a book. I said, I can't even read a book. Why should I write a book? <laughs> As Jesse mentioned, thanks to now high-speed digital audio, I do get to read a book every day. Changed my life. But I told Dr. Schuler, I, I just don't have any interest in writing a book. He said, this is something I feel quite strongly about. Well, at about that time, the MC introduced me, and I went out in the arena, and I did my hour. And as I came off stage, Dr. Waitley was standing there. He said, hey, while you were out there, we got it all worked out. <laughs> I thought he meant the ground transportation to the plane. I said, so what'd you boys work out? He said, while you were out there, Schuler called his publisher, Thomas Nelson, and I agreed to write the foreword, and he's going to do a cover endorsement, and we need your manuscript in 90 days. <laughs> and that's how I became an author. <laughs> I wrote down my experience of losing my football career and becoming an Olympic weightlifting champion, and um, starting narrative television and becoming a speaker, and put it in a book called You Don't Have to Be Blind to See. It came out and it was doing really well. And I thought, you know, everybody ought to write a book once in their life. And I wrote mine and the, that next fall, the publisher called me and said, Jim, this book is selling well. I said, well, that's what we wanted. And he said, yeah. He said, we're nearly ready for your follow-up book. I said, well, exactly what is a follow-up book? And he said, well, Jim, that's the book you come out with next to kind of capitalize on the success of your first book. I said, well, you should have told me that, or I wouldn't have written everything I knew in the first book. <laughs> I 
Well, by then I was interviewing a lot of movie stars on television for narrative TV. So I took some of their material and added in millionaires and billionaires and athletes and politicians. And I wrote a book called Success Secrets of Super Achievers. And then they wanted another book, so I wrote The Way I See the World. Then they wanted another book, and I did with Steve Forbes and Donald J. Trump. We wrote a book called Great American Success Stories. And, um, and I was really running out of material. I'd written everything I knew and a few things I only suspected. <laughs> so when they called up and they said, Jim, we want another book, I said, don't you have anybody else who wants to write a book? I mean, I have 10 million books in print. I put my phone number and my email address in all of them. I said, I hear from people all over the world that want to write books. And they said, well, we want another book from you. So uh, I had an idea overnight, and I thought, I've written everything I knew, so I'm going to make something up. I'm going to write a novel, make up a story here. So the next morning, my driver picks me up in the limo, and I'm sitting in the back, and... I get kind of bored, so I do something different every day, whether it's movies or television or books or columns or speeches or my radio shows. And so I get in, Michael said, boss, what are we doing today? I said, well, today, Michael, I'm going to write a novel. He said, you know anything about that? I said, about as much as these other books I've been writing. <laughs> and uh, I said, I do have the first line of the book. It says, it was my 80th year of life on earth and my 53rd year in the practice of the law that I was to undertake an odyssey that would change my existence forever. And I told Michael, I said, now if I can figure out who said that and what is he talking about, <laughs> we're going to have a book. Well, that's the first line of the book, The Ultimate Gift. And it changed my world, and that's when I got the call that started my constantly unfolding career that the Lord has led me through. That's why you give us this day our daily bread. If he gave it all to us once, it'd spoil, and you'd have to carry it around, and it'd scare you to death anyway. Just take the next step and wait. And... Um, and they came to me and they wanted to make a movie of it. And I'll never forget, I, I, I optioned it to a major studio and they said, um, you know, we want to option it for a year. Well, I wrote the book in five days. I don't know what you people are doing over there. <laughs> but they brought me a script at the end of a year for an R-rated film entitled The Ultimate Gift. And I said, guys, I have 2,200 public schools that use this as part of their curriculum. I'm not going to make a movie they can't go watch. And I, I, I'm not opposed to R-rated movies. Saving Private Ryan, Schindler's List, the, these need to be R-rated movies. But they were making the ultimate gift into an R-rated movie for no reason other than one of the attractive young ladies in the film. She entered our story coming out of the shower. And I said, well, we have four guys over 70. I got uh, James Garner, Brian Dennehy, Bill Cobbs, all these people, they're between 70 and 80. We don't show them getting out of the shower. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we assume these boys have good hygiene, but we, we're not sure about this 26-year-old uh, actress here. And I turned them down. I said, no thanks, guys. And they said, we've never had anybody turn us down. I said, well, you have now. And they said, Jim, you'll never work in Hollywood again. I said, I really wasn't planning on it up till now. <laughs> wasn't a month later, another studio called, said, do you still own the rights to that film? I said, so happens I do. They optioned it. I said, look, I just wasted a year. I'll give you six months. Would not have thought it possible, but they actually did it. They came up with a script worse than the first outfit. And I just said, well, okay, we're just not going to do that. And then a, a guy called me, and people always want to know, I've had 
hundreds if not thousands of authors say, how do you get into movies? Here's my technique. A guy I never heard of went into an airport bookstore, bought the ultimate gift for a flight from L.A. to Charlotte, read the whole book on the plane, forgot and left it in the seat back pocket. They didn't clean out the seat back pocket and a producer gets on who had just left Disney and was starting his own company and he gets on for a flight back from Charlotte to LA, reads it all the way, lands, calls me up and said, can we make a movie? That's my technique, guys. <laughs> That's productivity, Jesse. You pray a lot and just wait for the miracles. Well, Rick Eldridge called me and he said, uh, we'd like to turn that into a movie. And I said, Rick, I've been down this road twice before. He said, no, you're in control. I said, all I want is for the people that go to the movies to have the same experience that millions of my readers have had. And we made the movie and I've written three other books and we've had a movie trilogy and just, you know, they said, you can't be commercial, Jim. You can't be commercial and just have your message. Well, those three stories on film and on the page have grossed a little north of $100 million. Well, we had our run in the movies and things were working good and then, you know, I, um, a guy that used to run the Tulsa Business Journal read one of my books and said, what would you think of writing a column? I said, what would you think of telling me what that is exactly? <laughs> he said, you write 500 to 700 words of anything you're thinking about. So I dictated it, Dorothy typed it up, and we fired it off to him on the fax machine, that's how long ago it was. He called me 10 minutes later, said, where'd you get this? I said, I wrote it after you called me. He said, really? I said, yeah, he said, do that every Thursday. So I started writing this column. Every Thursday, I'd just write something I was thinking about and send it to him. And then after a while, I had other people ask about it, so I asked him, I said, do I own this or do you? He said, you do. <laughs> well, today, like I said, there's somewhere between three and four million people read that column every week. And the next page turned and the Lord was already there holding out his hand. And then there was a guy here in Tulsa, my late great friend, Pat Campbell. Yeah. I didn't know Patrick, but he called me one day and said, hey, I, I read your column and I think it'd be cool to do a show that was positive and upbeat uh, for New Year's. I said, okay. So I came on, we talked about the column and New Year's stuff. And he called me the next day and said, man, our numbers looked good overnight. Uh, let's do it again next week. Okay, so I did it next week. And he said, well, let's do it again next week. And I was eight years into next week when Pat went to heaven. I will never forget speaking at his funeral because they, they asked me to and they put me backstage and they said, we'll introduce you when it's your time. And um, I had no idea what I was going to say about But then um, instead of them introducing me or the minister, I was the last speaker up to eulogize Pat, and he said, instead of introducing me, we have a special introduction for our last speaker. And I heard Pat saying, now it's my favorite time of the week. Let's hear from my good friend, Jim Stovall. And as he always did, Patrick always got in the last word. <laughs> well, I did those shows in, um, people at Fox Radio heard it, and uh, the upside of that is I, I do a Monday show in Denver for Western United States and a Tuesday show out of New York City and, and just um, tell people the truth as I see it and what I believe. And, um, you know, and sometimes lay people, when we get into the public sector, we get worried because some of these career politicians, they know more than we do. But I had to tell some people up in Capitol Hill in Washington, what I believe is a lot more powerful than what you think you know. Yeah. 
Well, that's my journey. Because when I started out, I thought productivity and success was going from poverty to prosperity. And you've never met anybody poorer than we were, and you'll meet few people that have been more blessed than we are. But once I got there, I figured it out. I thought I was at the finish line, and I'm only halfway. Productivity and success is accepting the higher calling going from poverty to prosperity to purpose. Prosperity without purpose is like gasoline with no destination. You're ready to go and you got nowhere to be. Well, Crystal and my journey in giving and conspicuous philanthropy started my sophomore year at ORU. I had met Miss Crystal when I came there, the university didn't know what to do with me. They didn't have a football team. I'm going blind. I can't play ball anymore. I'm training for the Olympics. And they decided, well, we'll, we'll get students in each of your classes to read your text to you. Okay, if that's the way we're going to do this. And Crystal was in one of my classes. And as soon as I met her, I told the dean, uh, we won't need any of these other folks. I'll either make it with her or I won't make it. And uh, this June we will celebrate 43 years on our way to forever together. And this is the point in the proceedings where Crystal likes me to point out something. And even though she decided to be on the beach in Fort Lauderdale, When you see her, tell her that I told this, even though she wasn't here. As much as it pains me. See, Crystal graduated first in our class. And I graduated second. Now, if you graduated second in your class, that ain't that bad, guys. Unless you live with number one. I'm like the Olympian, I, you know, that's my career, Olympic weightlifting champion. But I wake up every morning and realize I got the silver medal. <laughs> but once you get to the point you realize I'm okay with the fact I'm not the smartest person in my house, you have a good life. <laughs> well, it was my sophomore year and I was sitting there in chapel, fourth row from the back in the very corner in my assigned seat, and our speaker that day was a guy, a missionary from Africa. And he dug water wells so that people would have clean drinking water. There was nothing else memorable about what he did. And at the end of his talk, Oral got up and said, I believe we should take up a collection and help this man. I thought that was a great idea, except for one thing. I only had $17 to my name. I had a 10, a 5, and two ones, and they were in my pocket. But as the basket came around, I reached in and took out a $1 bill. And I'm just about to throw it in the basket, and Oral says, stop. And I loved Oral. He was my father's boss, and I remember him as a kid pushing me down the driveway on my sled, and then he was president of the university I attended, and for the last 12, 15 years of his life, we were just friends. We exchanged audio books and talked about them. And he had had a lot of roles to me. But that day, he said, stop. And it was like one of those old E.F. Hutton commercials, you know. Everything just stops. And he said, somebody here needs to hear this. Either give your best and expect the best or keep your money because you're going to need it. Fork in the road. Put my dollar bill up with great fear and trepidation and shaking hands, I got out my $10 bill. Threw it in the basket and after chapel, I went to meet Miss Crystal. I was really nervous because we had a date that night and we weren't exactly a couple yet. And I was already thinking my $17 date's gonna be a little thin. <laughs> so when I saw Crystal, she said, what'd you think of chapel? I said, well, I got good news, I got bad news. The good news is I helped that man with his water wells. The bad news is 
we're going to have a $7 date. Well, she was very gracious then, like she is now. And she said, well, why don't we just eat in the dining room and go for a walk? I quickly calculated it and said, you know, I could, I could handle that. We end up over in the Graduate Center in an empty lecture room. And she said, what do you think we're going to do when we get out of college? Well, there'd never been any we's in any of our conversations up to that point. So I took that as a positive sign. Of course, as Zig Ziglar said, I'm an optimist. You know, I go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with me. I'm not kidding here. I mean, my book says all things are possible. I don't need any more details. That's, that's what I need to know right there. So she said, what do you think we're gonna do when we get out of college? Well, I could still see a little bit. So I jump up on the board and I start writing with the marker. I said, I'm gonna start my own company and then I'm gonna be a millionaire and then I'm gonna write a book and then they're gonna make movies. And I wrote all these things down. And the last thing on the list I wrote, someday I'm gonna find something I care about as much as that little guy cared about those water wells and I'm gonna write somebody somewhere a check for a million dollars. That's bold for a blind guy with seven bucks. But just like I'd written it in a movie script, every one of those things happened. But it took a while, and then that last thing, I never found my thing. I mean, we started a scholarship at the university. We've sent 500 kids to college. We rebuilt the administrative center there and named it after my parents. We fed over a million people in war-torn and uh, hurricane victims around the world. But I never found my thing until six years ago this spring. I was sitting in a board meeting at ORU. And Dr. Wilson said, what do you think we ought to be doing in the year 2030? We're not doing now. And we broke up into groups and we threw out all these ideas. And somebody said, you know, we ought to have a school of entrepreneurship so kids could come from around the world and learn how to do this. Yeah. And that idea just wouldn't leave me alone. People ask me all the time, Jim, how do you find the true calling for your life? Just shut up and it'll crawl all over you. Won't leave you alone. But you keep saying, well, I don't know how to do that and I'd never be able to do that. And No, no. If you know how to do it and have all the resources at hand, you've missed the higher calling. So I studied all that summer about what other universities have done. In that fall, I called Dr. Wilson. I said, Billy, I want you to come over to the house. I got an idea I want to run by you. If you like it, I'll give you a million dollars. You ever want to meet with a college president? <laughs> They'll be there within the hour. <laughs> he came over and I, I laid out my plan for the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship. And he said, I like it. I need to go to the trustees and make sure I'll be back within two weeks. Two weeks later, he walks into the gym they love it. In fact, they added some ideas to it, Jim. It's not going to cost a million dollars. It's going to cost two million dollars. Here I am again. Either give your best and expect the best or keep your money. I said, Billy, I'll give you the million. I promised you I'll give you a half million dollars more. And you come up with somebody to match it. You come up, raise the money. He called me three days later and said, we got a half million. I said, Billy Wilson, where'd you get a half million dollars in three days? He said, Mark Green. And I said, Mark Green was sitting in my small group at the table when we came up with this idea. And we were joking with him and saying, Mark, why don't you do this and have the Green Center for Entrepreneurship? And Mark clearly said, I don't want to have a Green Center for Entrepreneurship. So I called Mark. And I said, you told me you did not want to have a Green Center for Entrepreneurship. He said, no, we don't. But we'll put a half million dollars into the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship. And he said, we'd like that to remain anonymous. I said, not on your life. <laughs> We're not gonna have the number one entrepreneur family in the state of Oklahoma as my partner and not tell everybody. So if anybody asks you about the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship, just tell them the greens are in for a half a mil. <laughs> well, with, in... Uh, about seven weeks, we'll be graduating our second class of four-year students. We have students from all 50 states and over 100 nations on campus, and it's changing the world.
Well, Crystal and I went to chapel that day. When we announced we were going to give the million dollars, and we gave them a million and a half dollars, and afterwards they had a car for us, and we get in the back. And I said, well, babe, how do you feel now? You're a million and a half dollars poorer than you were an hour ago. She said, I never felt richer in my life. Well, we kind of liked that. And every year at the end of the year, I meet with my accountants and my attorneys. And at the end of the year, somehow, due to divine accounting, we had more money than we started with. So I thought, let's do this again. Well, one of the many companies I consult with is a debt consolidator out of New York City. And I was up there for a meeting with them. And I asked one of their computer guys, I said, you have millions of people in there. Can you segregate out medical debt from student loan debt or car debt or home debt or credit card debt? And he said, sure. I said, uh, find a million dollars worth of medical debt in there that various families have. And he said, why? I said, I'm going to buy it. And he said, well, Jim, are you going out into competition with us? You're our consultant. I said, no, I'm not going into I said, just do it. So he handed me a list. He said, here's 1,184 families that collectively have a million dollars in medical debt they can't pay. I said, great. Here's a check for a million dollars. Write them all a letter and tell them they are forgiven. Tell them they are forgiven. And I just, I said, before I leave, I do want to have the experience. Just give me the names and number of, of 10 or 12 of those people. I just want to call them and experience this. As God is my witness, the first guy I called is a truck driver from Valdosta, Georgia. And I called him. I said, sir, you probably got a letter recently saying that your medical debt was paid off. And I'm the one that did it. And I just wanted to let you know I'm praying for you. We're expecting better things for you and your family. And he was thanking me. And I could hear on his end of the phone someone had come into the room where he was. And he told them, hey, I'm on the phone here. This is the man that paid for April's eyes. I said, sir, what was that? He said, well, my wife came in, and I wanted her to know you were on the phone. I said, no, I get that part. Tell me about April's eyes. He said, Jim, April's our little girl. And she's seven years old, and we love her more than our life itself. She had to have a series of three operations to save her eyesight. Our insurance paid for the first one and part of the second one, but they wouldn't do the third one until we paid off the debt on the second one. I've been working three jobs. My wife's been working two. We've sold everything, and we just couldn't do it. And then your letter came in, and last week April had her third operation, and he said, Mr. Stovall, you'll never know what it means to save someone's eyesight. <laughs> then when you're doing what you're doing, and I'll close with this, and you're in the center of the will for God, and you're, you've gone from poverty, you've just blown right through prosperity, and you're just living for purpose. Things happen that you didn't really have anything to do with. They just happen because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Well, I have 10 million books in print and our contact info is in every one. I return every call and I answer every email. If you don't believe that, try it. Well, when I come in every morning, the ladies have, they kind of have them lined out with, you know, drafts of responses to people. And most people say pretty much the same thing. But Beth said, Jim, there's one here I don't know what to do with. You're just going to have to call this guy directly. He sends an email, said, Mr. Stovall, I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You saved my life. I got the kidney transplant last week. I asked Beth, are we doing something over at the foundation I didn't know about? And, uh, well, this guy had left his phone number. And I said, hello, I'm Jim Stovall, and I got your note, and I'm glad you got a kidney and uh, saved your life, but I didn't have anything to do with it. He said, well, I'm up here in Alaska, and they told me I was going to die if I didn't get it, and I was just a few days away, and I was in this international transplant donor exchange, 
And they called me and said, we have a match. And they flew this kidney in and they gave it to me. And four days later, I was out of the hospital feeling great. And I told the people at the exchange, I'd like to call that family and thank them for whoever it was that donated this kidney. And he said, Jim, the exchange told me the person that donated your kidney is alive and well. And he said, well, will you give me their name? I'd like to thank them. And the exchange said, sir, they want to remain anonymous, but they said, if you want to thank anybody for the fact you got a kidney, find Jim Stovall and thank him for writing a book called The Gift of Giving, because that's how come you got a kidney. Wow. My book, The Gift of Learning, one of my publishers, Charlie Tremendous Jones, real name, Charlie Tremendous Jones, always said you'll be the same person you are today five years from now, except for the books you read and the people you meet. And I wrote The Gift of Learning about how you can change your life by changing your mind. My book, uh, probably the best novel I've written, I hope it'll be our next movie after The Will to Win when we're working on now. It's called One Season of Hope, and it takes place at Harry Truman High School, and like in all of my homecoming historicals, the uh, namesake of the school like gets involved, like Will Rogers in Will to Win and Top of the Hill with Napoleon Hill. Well, um, this one features a young man losing his life and wants to finish high school and play one more season of football. His name is Bradley Hope, and it's called One Season of Hope. It's out there. Now, some of my Republican brethren and sistren get all upset at the, when this book came out. I couldn't believe it. You know, Christians, they used to feed us to the lions. Now we just eat each other. <laughs> and I wrote this book. And they said, Jim, you don't realize Harry Truman was a Democrat during those years. I said, so was Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I mean, think about it. So anyway, you, see, you can have that one. And then my book, uh, Winner for Wisdom, it's a compilation of some of my columns. And to my knowledge, my publisher told me they have never found anybody else um, I started writing that book when Donald and I were doing some speaking engagements together. And I said, would you write something I can put on the back of this book? And he did. And then while they were putting it together, he, he said, I'm going to run for president. I thought he was kidding, to be real honest at first. I called him. I said, this is going to be great for your apprentice show, you know, kind of good publicity there. And by that spring, I realized, you know, he isn't kidding. And um, so the publisher said, we're going to go ahead and put that on the book. And... Uh, it's probably the only book in publishing history endorsed by a sitting president. And so you can have any of those you want. And uh, my phone number, my email's in all of them. Anytime you think these things don't happen for people like you, anytime you think the promises aren't real, anytime you have doubts and fears, you pick up the phone or shoot me an email. Because the worst it ever seems, the farthest away it ever appears, the most difficult it ever feels, I want you to know you've got one guy who believes in you and believes in the higher calling and the purpose for your life. You don't think so. You just pick up the phone and call me. And we'll go into that little voting booth in the middle of your soul that only you and God know about. And we'll talk about the higher calling for your life. And only two people get to vote, you and God, and I'm going to ask you to reach out and pull that lever and vote for yourself. And once you do that, you'll find out he voted for you a long time ago. As always, I will leave you with this. Hold on to your dreams and stand tall, even when those around you would force you to crawl. Hold on to your dreams as a race you must run, even when reality whispers you'll never be done. And finally, my friends at City Elders, hold on to your dreams and wait for the miracle to come. Because on that miraculous day, your dream and your reality will merge into one. Love you more than I can say. See you next time.